Well, it's pretty impressive that even when I'm not on my own stream, I can manage to stall the MSQ. But today we are going to be doing something very interesting. We promised you on All Craft that we were going to have even more devs on the show, get to talk about a whole bunch of games. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. We are joined with the devs from V Rising. We have a lot to talk to them about. Peter and Martin, welcome to the show. I, I think it makes a lot of sense right now to actually start off with just giving a little introduction to both of you for everybody in chat so they can get to meet you. Peter, if you want to start off and uh, let everybody know who you are. Thank you. And it's uh, really exciting to be here with you today, guys. Um, I'm, I'm Peter. I'm the game director at uh, Sunlock Studios. I'm also one of the, the founder of the company. So I've been here from, from the start. And uh, in, in my role, I basically work with all departments of the game. I work on the, the vision, the game designs. I work with our engineers, our artists, sound, music, marketing, uh, you name it. So I'm like uh, on top of all different parts and uh, in depth with the development. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, I'm Martin, and I'm uh, working as creative director for V Rising. I also uh, joined or started, founded the company together with Ilves, and I think we were 12 other students from the university. Oh. And um, my role uh, is mostly focused on, on all of the in-game or, or like the game itself and not so much around the, the, the thing outside of the game. So uh, I try to push the game into different, like following our vision and coming up with all new kind of cool features. And, and Peter is the one who tried to hold me back and he's more responsible of like delivering on time and, and deliver with the quality we want. So he's holding me back and I'm trying to push forward. So. <laughs> you're, you're the dreamer and he's the dreamer. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. we work uh, very much too close to each other and, and working on implementation of features and, and those things as well. So I wouldn't we're, we're say definitely... I'm, I'm, I'm the businessman. Like I'm, I'm definitely, I'm the VP as well. So I do have that on my end, but I'm uh -huh. also a big dreamer and I'm also loving all the things we're doing. So uh, we've been working together since the start, me and Martin. So like we know each other outs and ins. When was the start? Um, so, so we, we did like meet up in, okay, this, this, the story is that we, we met up in 2007, I think I met Martin Ooh. and we were both student, uh, going to a uh, university here in Hövde, this little town in Sweden where we are located, uh, and we were studying game development. Uh, and at the, at that time we were both like avid, uh, World of Warcraft players. Um, and, uh, we met up, uh, like and ended up on a project in the school at the same time. And uh, I, I, I know I remember that I, like, I was playing in, in, a, in, a, in, in a guild named Cursed at the time. Um, and we're like, uh, um, we were competing for, for world first bosses. And, uh, and uh, I had like, had, had this like, I always wanted to be a game developer and I've been living like World of Warcraft has been my life for about three years now at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that when I have uh, was like a uh, an like changing point in my life where I had to choose should I like continue playing World of Warcraft or should I go into game development because now now I had really like I did not have time for both at that time. Um, and I met with Martin that's also been like an avid World of Warcraft player and we just connected really good at that time. Um, and uh, I, I came more from like before I played World of Warcraft, I played like Warcraft 3 on, on like high level, played in, in Grandmaster League and stuff like that. And then oh, wow. World of Warcraft came out and I just got hooked into that. We didn't fight for world first, but we'd fight for server first. And we still like cleared Nax on, on, on Classic, which is only like 5%, I think. Uh, and I, I, I think I started like uh game development just for a reason to kind of continue play and meet other gamers so so that's that's why that's incredible oh my god so you guys it's not like something you just played a little bit you guys have played a lot of the same games that we have and to be honest like more seriously than us uh that's yeah, i impressive. still haven't cleared next uh to be <laughs> well unless yeah. you can't count the wrath version i did manage to do that but it's kind of funny to see that you guys kind of started everything that 
you did in World of Warcraft the same that Asmin and I I did as well. But for you guys, obviously V Rising wasn't the first step. Uh, Battle Right was the the first game that you guys actually did put out, actually, correct? Actually, actually, it was Bloodline Champions was our first title, oh. uh, and Battle Right is the the like the successor of that basically. So, uh, Bloodline Champions was was like very inspired by by World of Warcraft actually. Like many think that it was the MOBAs that was our like main inspiration to the game, as it's like many times times said as it's the the MOBA without like the laning and all the, the the bullshit but but in reality it was like we were playing a lot of world of warcraft pvp i was playing a lot of arena and that was the main inspiration we wanted to make an arena game a pvp arena game that that took the things that we really loved from from world of warcraft but but like did it in our way and and we like yeah, to be honest, we, we didn't like the randomness, like the oh, the resist of kidney shot and stuff, and say like let's make an arena game without the bullshit, basically. You know what? I can really relate to that. I really can. I I totally do, and that's incredible. So you just took matters into your own hands. You made this game, and then after that, I guess you made like I just looked it up, pulled it up on Steam. You made one other game before then, then you made Battle Right. Battle Right did pretty well. Yeah, ba Battle Royale was like our real breakthrough hit yeah. uh, back in 2016, and it's like the refined, refined experience of uh, of Bloodline Champions. So we we spent some years, as I said, we started as a group of students. I think we were 14 actually, uh, and at that time in 2008, like we did, we started working on Bloodline Champions, and then we eventually founded the company, and. Uh, as of today, we're still twelve of, of of the founders back back from two thousand and eight are still are still in the company. So I think that's one of like our biggest strength that has allowed us to push through through the years, as we've had both ups wow. and downs. Um, and uh, when we released Battle Right, that was like uh, the best one of the best moments, of course, in in our life, and seeing how well it was received, like seeing how this this man of players just like loaded into the game and it was like it was a really cool moment in in, in the history of Starlock. Well I, I bet I mean it must have been like a massive accomplishment to have like such a game do so well and and just kind of pop off like that and and we're seeing it happen again now with V Rising I mean I've seen it in the top 10 charts for Steam there are just tons of people that love the game and I mean how do you feel about like everything that's happened uh, since the, it's not even really the full release, but uh, since it's been made to the public, yeah, it's it's really cool. I mean, we didn't expect the huge kind of impact it had. We had our hopes, but it was just uh, way way above our imagination. Yeah, yeah it's I like am... an amazing, like release. We didn't, we didn't just couldn't hope for these numbers, uh, and and I think we're also a bit like it's a very different game to develop. Maybe we'll come into that a bit later, but. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have that instant like um, adrenaline kick that you get from Battle Right, and we had a lot of like fun developing and playing Battle Right even early in the development cycle. While V Rising was a, a much bigger, more ambitious project that it took like years before we could even play it. So it's a very two very different games. Um, so so uh, it was really a relief, as always, when you release a game when you've been working on it for three years time to see that is actually flying um it is yeah. popping off I, I was very curious like because the games they're, they're definitely you can see some threads of similarity for sure like with with how they feel but very different games like you mentioned what made you start to design v rising after battle right was it learnings that you actually had from the title or was it just an idea that that came up and you started to move into it so there's it's like uh you want me to start martin or do you uh, yeah you uh, can start just yeah, okay um so, so at the time we we did struggle a lot with battle right we we, we like had had an uh, uh had issues with like getting the the game on its feet and we tried a lot of things and we come to like this point in stunlock where we had to sit down and and, and talk together with the the other founders which we've always done after a project and see where do we want to bring it next um and uh, at that point, we like saw that we had to shift focus to something, something new. Uh, but we did want to bring like what what have we learned, what are our learnings, 
And in Battle Ride, we have this very adrenaline view, very intense combat experience. It's it's very reminiscent, reminiscent to a fighting game, actually. It's super fun, you're playing it, but you eventually, or most players, got really burnt out very quickly on that experience. So we had always had trouble like with working with the retention factor and getting players back there. We couldn't, we created new content, but players were just burning through it too quickly. Um, and we'd scale up the studio. So we were about like 50 people at that time. Um, and we just, for the first time in Starlock, we had to like scale back. We had to scale down the studio. And, and that I think was one of the, the hardest part for us because we are this very small developer, but very, we have like more like a family, I would say. Uh, I think that comes from having this core of developers that we've always been working together. Um, but from that and from that, having those people close by us, our, our like colleagues that are totally amazing, we, we found this energy, found this ambition to start something new. Um, and we wanted to take this like combat system, this, this, this fun, this fuel that we have. And we also wanted to, so, to find a, a core loop where we can combine our strengths with something that is a bit more relaxed something that doesn't like burn you out. So we had a lot of like discussions and ideas for how we could like, what sort of genre can we combine this with that would make a perfect fit. Um, and um, so we talked about like being, can we find some PVE element? And, and how can we find a way to not only have this combat orientation, can we find something more creative where you can build, where you can uh, maybe apply together with your friends? And uh, maybe Martin, you want to like yeah, add something think, to that? Uh, as as you said, like we're very strong in creating multiplayer, so we know that's mm -hmm. like one big strength. And when we try to look at like the survival genre, which is very popular, uh, and we felt like there's a lot of survival games that maybe is only solo or co-op, and we could bring our experience from like multiplayer PvP and create something new in this. Uh, and and that's where we we kind of felt like. The survival genre also helps us to give that kind of pacing issue that Ilves talked about to give that control to the players. Like if you want to have high action, you can go out and, and go for bosses. You can go out and, and go to those kind of highly combat areas. Uh, and if you want to relax, you can just start to like decorate your castle and, and focus on, on gathering trees. So I think those were so strong uh, to solve that kind of big issue we had from our previous title. And that's where the kind of the vampire team eventually ended up because we felt, we felt like we were used to create like champions with lots of magic and different abilities. And we wanted to kind of have a theme that kind of can fit to that. If we would go more like realistic, we would be very limited to what we can do. And then like when we found the vampire team, it's what made so much sense because we could use magic and like vampire in its core I, is like I this kind of hunt for like, blood, right? Yeah. Like that, that day, like we sat down, I knew I was in, in my office uh, and we had like R&D, a couple of different games, different prototypes. And we're talking about what is this theme? What is the theme? Like we know what the systems, what the game we want to make, uh, but we don't know what 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 can we package this. What is what is this theme? And I think we we discussed like uh, this more generic fantasy themes. We I think we also like discussed Norsemen and Vikings, and and that would have been a bit uh, embarrassing today uh, <laughs> uh, if we had yeah. gone, gone with that. Um, but uh, no Martin came into my office like on a Monday, and it has been. I think you'd like watched the entire like Castlevania Netflix series. Yeah, and you you just came in with this comment and said, "I mm, I I good, got yeah. it. Like I know what we're going to do. I haven't never like seen Martin that confident in my life." And it's like, and then <laughs> pitch pitch the idea. Like you wake up in this coffin, you 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 feel like a hunger for blood, and you grab a rat and you like suck it dry. You're like this vampire that has just awoken. You've like been stripped out of all your powers. You need to go out in the world and rebuild your gothic big castle and it's it's anarchy all the vampire clans are rising and are just fighting each other and you should you need to become the next Dracula and yeah. it's like at that moment it's like yes 
Yes. It's a no discussion. Uh, well, you gonna, put a lot of make this game. Uh, Yeah. You put so much effort into like making the different, like the small nuances of vampires, like a, this is a, cons- a consistent thing that you experience throughout playing the game. It's not like, oh, you burn in sunlight. It's like the silver. It's like the conspicuously counting things of them being like OCD kind of. And it seems like you really put a lot of effort and time into making sure that whenever somebody is playing, playing v rising they don't forget what the v stands for yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's so much strong a strength with the vampire team as well because if we come up with like our own fantasy team it's so hard to relate right and the vampire team like everyone knows about vampires and knows their weaknesses so that's also such a big strength in the survival genre that you can actually before you even play it you can actually kind of get a get a feeling of how would it be to to be a vampire in this world and that's very strong in and those kind of this kind of genre as well so yeah, one of I... the things uh yes uh, but one of the things we did early was to establish that we wanted to play on as many of these traits as we possibly could and it wasn't always easy like it took a long time for us to come up with all these mechanics but we really like in our vampire fantasy we talked talked many times about it like more of a vampire simulator if you were like a vampire what would happen to you so we really try to just encompass all these different traits and make fun use of them yeah i was a huge fan instantly of of the genre like you mentioned getting magic in a survival game is pretty rare and for me blood sucking is something that that i love i mean it's it's pretty core to my identity as a human being so I, the second that I started to see everything, I was like, man, this game really does make a lot of sense to me. I love getting the, the sling the magic, but the, one of the coolest things that I, I think that you did is you took all of those tropes, like like as we mentioned with the silver, with, with uh, being weak to the sun as a vampire, and also even just the blood sucking itself, and not only did you have it there, it's just like, oh, the sun's gonna kill you, like when it's day, you're gonna die, but there are these really cool twists to all of them like the feeling of running around as a wolf with like everybody that you're playing with on the server and running around looking for shade is such a satisfying moment that i never expected to have in a vampire game and then those moments when you're actually in combat with different mobs and you're like oh my god this is a 100 blood type this is gonna like i'm gonna make sure that i like get this brute right now uh it, it's another really satisfying and deep moment in the game and i'm kind of curious how did did those ideas evolve a lot over time? Did you go, oh, okay, we're gonna start adding to the actual like feed system. Uh, we're gonna add to the sunlight. Or were some of these ideas just core to the development process and you knew from day one they were gonna be there? Uh, yeah, as you can say, the, the vision was there kind of early, like the sun, the sun mechanic, obviously, and, and the feed, but all of the system has really been like developed over time and adapted to changes in other features and, and the bosses. And, and it's yet like lots of the things kind of appear to us as an epiphany, like playing a versus a boss during the night. And it's like, yeah, this is easy. I can just dodge this nowhere. And then the sun rises and suddenly you're like, shit, I hope I, I had that stand. happen. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> yes. that's a kind of very satisfying feeling to see how impactful the sun system is and how you actually have to kind of think about it so it, it gets even better whenever they destroy the trees around you and the shade yeah. that you thought you could rely on is now gone yes I, i've had this experience very clearly yeah we had a really fun moment in that when we were like testing stress testing the game and we were like i think we we're like 60 vampires fighting the end game boss and uh, uh, uh yes for stress testing it and then there was only one tree and the sun came up and it said 60 vampires were standing under this one tree where yeah. like this real big boss were like looking at them. What are they doing? Uh... Yeah, one thing that I really liked about the game, uh, I just want to say real quick, is that, uh, like, obviously, there's been many comparisons. Other games, one of the main ones, Valheim, right? I played through Valheim. I I did all of that. And one thing that I really did appreciate with it is the fact that you have, like, a much more involved PvE system. I haven't, honestly, I've been too afraid to go to one of the PvP servers yet. I've watched people play a lot, but I've been too afraid to lose all my stuff. But um, doing the PvE content just by yourself and slowly progressing is actually a pretty fulfilling experience and there's a lot of levels to it and and i found it to be very enjoyable to just kind of work through them and then find the next boss and then some of the end game bosses 
they're no joke. Like I, I, I this is like I thought it was going to be like one of those easy games that does like two abilities. Uh, no, I was yeah, impressed. Like, I think again, it's like some of this inspiration is is very old school MMOs as yeah. well, uh, and 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 also being from Battle Right, being a more hardcore PvP game. Mm-hmm. We didn't like we we wanted to go more of this for this core gamer or a bit more hardcore. So we, we, we wanted to nail that balance and we were like in development and asking ourselves, obviously, is it too hard? Is it too easy? But we were always, let's let's rather go too hard and too easy. That, that's like what we wanted to do. Um, yeah, we, we focus a lot to like just have add so much setting as possible so players can like actually tune down the difficulty. But we think it's really important to to have it like as a survival game it it can't be too easy because then it's kind of boring it feels more like a grind like i'm just gonna clear the content but more go like actually feeling like killing a a, a world worker boss for the first time like that kind of feeling i know yeah, that kind I... of feeling when you're like <laughs> world first no <laughs> Yeah, I definitely don't know the world first feeling, but I will say that there are a lot of really good feelings with those bosses, too. I love I love like the actual tracking system, right, where, where you go to the altar and you, you kind of set out on a day and you're like, this is this is my main goal. But I think one of the things that the game also does that's very cool is the emergent moments, right? They're you're going for a certain boss and now it's like, oh, there's the vampire hunter or there's this boss. Do we have that one yet? Uh, or are we going to suck him dry? And I feel like there are so many little emergent things. And as somebody who went to school for game design and really only got opportunities to work on bad games, how do you guys plan for those emergent moments? Like, what do you actually, like, how do they get built in over time? I think that was one of the uh, early things that we wanted to adopt. Like, because we're a small team uh, and we knew we, like, couldn't create enormous worlds with too much content so we're, we're always talking about how can we create like uh, a dynamic world uh, and how can we have these emergent moments uh, and the sun is obviously one of those things that really changes things up but also the the, the, the global patrol systems that like these different uh, units the bosses can patrol the entire world uh, in conjunction with like other players with the sun um and try us to like find these moments that 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 are not scripted, but where the systems just play into into one another. Uh, and that's also one of the aspects that we really want to look that we're looking at right now when we're going forward. How can we create even more accesses where which more emerged gameplay can can occur? Like uh, weather system, for example, like the Blood Moon right now. These kind of mm-hmm. events as well oh, that yeah. that when you layer them on top of one another. Like we can create these stories or these events, but you're like you're playing it for like maybe the third or fourth times, but you're still like getting these new types of histories or experiences. You want to talk about- time I hit a blood moon, I started LARPing, dude. I, I like couldn't even help it. I was just oh like, God. ah, yes. <laughs> like, like I rise from my coffin. Like I just went full on. Like, and I think the game does a really good job at at opening up. Uh, I, I kind of. This is going to be a really weird analogy. Sorry, I sometimes make them, but it was like the first time that I watched Naruto. Oh I kept God. feeling, <laughs> I'm sorry, man, I'm a weave. But you kept, you, the world opens up more and more. And as you get deeper and deeper into the story, you really, you feel, you start to, stop making fun of me. You really start to feel like, a, you start to feel like a ninja yourself. You know what I mean? And I was, I was watching that show and I was like, oh man, the gin Cherokee. And I'm like, maybe I'm a gin Cherokee. Maybe that's why I'm a little bit off. I am Naruto. I felt very much the same way with your game. And I felt like all of the, the gameplay mechanics that open up as you, you take down that first boss, then you actually have the blood altar. You start to, to build build your castle and as the different systems open up you get more and more interested in the actual narrative element and you really do feel like you're playing a game where you are a vampire and uh, i i think it's something that doesn't happen very often in games it's rare it's incredible to see yeah it, it's very rare for a game that does that and you actually have like the the real vibe of the character and you're talking a little bit more of emergent gameplay and one of the differences that i see with this game versus a lot of their survival games is that if you look at like let's say like rust or uh valheim or other games uh, the map is procedurally generated and i was actually a little bit curious why you decided to go with the um having one map for pretty much the whole game rather 
rather than having it be generated randomly? Is it because of the sun effects or what, or is it just something that might happen in the future? Do you want to yeah, talk about that, Marty? I, I can take it. I mean, uh, we, we're obviously looking at and improving things to create more replayability in a sense and those kind of new thing, uh, happenings. But we also think it was very important to kind of handcraft the world because that will also help us reach like a, a higher level of polish and we can kind of tell a story and we can guide a player through through the world in a better way. Uh, that doesn't mean we will like keep trying to see what we can do, but mm -hmm. that has definitely helped us kind of sell in the whole vampire world because there, there's trick tricky when yeah, you kind of uh... go full also, like we, we did actually have like more of uh, uh, exper experimenting with more procedurally generated like pieces of the world in the in the early phases, yeah. but the top down camera also makes it really uh, much much harder to navigate the world and find in the world, find your stuff in the world because you don't have this horizon. You cannot like see the shape of the mountain where you're going. So uh, we have to spend a lot more like time in trying to like put energy and handcrafting these roads and making sure that like players at least know somewhat where they are going. So that, that's that been like a, a challenge to, to design an open world top-down game without an horizon. Uh, and I think that's also like one of the reasons where like once we started to handcraft things and and, and everything also aesthetically looked a lot better when you when you put like hands on it, uh, it came together a lot better with, with the world. But that said, like we are still like intrigued by the idea of creating a bigger world like creating a replayability and uh, maybe there's like ways of combining the handcrafted pieces of, of our world with more generated content as well to scale up yeah, as, as exactly. like we have this world which, which needs to host a lot of vampires as well right we have top-down building and we need to fit all players that was also like a big challenge because we have some crowded servers i think we like had one server with over 2,000 players that have like there was no space players just build in oh every God. single corner of the world uh, and and that was like like how, how how many players can one world digest um so it's a lot of things a lot of interesting level design uh, uh challenges that we are have been facing within with, within this development and and we're still do and we're seeing what we will do do next to even push and improve the world further yeah, I, I am curious, like, what is coming next, right? So, uh, obviously, like, from the, the PvE side, uh, you, you have all of the different V-powers that, that you're going for. You have, uh, what what are the other progression loops? You have all of the gear progression loops, and then all of the uh, all of the loops when it actually comes to, like, gathering new resources. Mm -hmm. um, do, is that an area where you want to, to see it go even further? Or is it stuff in the world that you're looking to change PvP, or is it like a mix of everything? I think it's it will definitely be a mix of everything. That they, that they, what we want you to experience when we have the full like the full launch, the full experience of V Rising, is that the, the the entire journey will be there will be added things on top of everything. So it, we're not like looking at just adding like end game content and and increasing the number of things you have to do in the end game, but rather look at, as we were speaking about like this emergent gameplay things, how can we, how can we add these accesses so that it's fun. With and different reliable. events and stuff. Yeah, yeah. With different events, for example, with the, uh, with more faction battles, uh, with weather systems, for example, uh, different accesses that we are looking into, uh, content wise, I guess it's, it's the simplest answer. It will, will be, there will be more like weapons, spells, we, bloods. we will add more to the current loop. Um, but we also important. have. Yeah, you can finish, Peter. Yeah, no, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we also have like getting obviously a lot of suggestions from the community. So we set up a, a web page, which is like if you go to feedback.playvrising.com, players can like add their own ideas and you can vote. And those are kind of a good way for us to see like where the community wants the game to head. Uh, and like currently, like the top. Uh, request the thing is to add different like a second floor or a basement to the to the castle and that's obviously a lot of difficulties with our top-down game which is like both 2d and 3d but that's something we definitely also kind of feel intrigued about and uh, and feel like when looking at the inspiration from castlevania you have this kind of 
got the cast which rises to the sky, right? So that's definitely an area we want to investigate more in. Uh, and, yeah. And, you know, I actually had a question about that because it's a really cool moment when you switch over, I guess it's from wood to stone, and then all of a sudden you, you close in all those walls and the roof just actually builds itself, right? You get the covering for the yep. first time. You don't have to use the, the bone uh, brasier anymore. I, I've, I'm not sure if I, I... Is that how you say? Is it brasier? Is it brasier? I, I don't know how to say it. You would think that I would, but uh, I, I uh, that moment when you actually do switch over is a very cool moment in the game. And I was curious if the auto completion of the roof at stone if that was by nature because it was difficult with the top down view to actually have players create their own uh roof or if that was something that you just felt like was missing for other games like i'm kind of curious how you guys came up with that i idea. think like when we designed a castle like building systems we wanted them to be very like um nice to use like you should you should like be able to like move things around simply like ro rotate them and i think that goes into that design of like making sure that it's not too much of a hassle and i'm building a roof in top down while you want to rearrange your floors maybe change like the walls and having to like restructure everything because you wanted to like move one wall for example is is something we wanted to to avoid in that space um so that that like out the generation of the roof was like a very nice way for us to just not make it too too like difficult uh, or uh, too much of a hassle for the player to like rearrange the castle every time they wanted to change something um i i uh found it way easier to to build in this game i will say though my viewers did build my castle so that was one of the reasons that it was so easy but <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's really cool to see how different castle to castle it does look, even though, you know, the roof is auto-completing. And it's definitely a very cool moment in the game as well when you hit that for the first time. There's a lot of people that have asked about uh, having multiple levels. In a lot of games, you can have like two and three floors for things. Uh, is that something that you think that you'll ever add? So you can make a larger base that just has like three or four floors? Yeah, I think that that's... We're really intrigued about that idea, and we we've like we have we have like been testing with it internally, um, and that would also solve some of the like level design issues with with the space that is required right now. So yeah, we're definitely uh, as as we like, and it also plays into the vampire theme, like this big gothic big castle, and we always want yeah. to like emphasize on the the vampiric feel of the game. So, so it's definitely something we are intrigued about. But as Martin were, were saying, it's it's, a, it's just the technical difficulties of a two D slash three D game that we will need to figure out, uh, and uh, we hope that we will be able to do so. So, one of the other questions that I I have just I, I always get really interested in a lot of the systems. So, I, I will say a lot of my questions will probably end up being more PVE focused than PvP focused, but. Um, there's some really interesting things that happen as you start to get later and later into the game where the amount of time it's going to take you to progress and actually craft a piece of gear obviously is going to change. What type of tuning knobs do you guys actually look at? Like, how do you decide this is a good amount of time to actually take to progress the gear compared to, you know, a, a previous tier to make it feel like it's a, a more powerful piece compared to maybe being a little bit too slow and potentially having some players back away from the challenge. It's, yeah, it's definitely a big challenge. I've been working very hands-on with the itemization and the drop tables and everything in that regards. And the, the simple answer is play test, play test, play test. Uh, we've been doing lots of internal play test and get a feel for it. While also like, of course, looking at some of the data and, and listening to all players. But it is it is a challenge because you can play it single player. When you play four player, you like more than four x your 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 speed at your gathering things, and it's way different if you know the second time you play it and you know all the systems you use. You use the refinements uh, uh, tools that are in your castle. You use your servants that will help you a lot in in those regards. So it's it's uh, we're trying to like learn or teach the player about the different systems as much as we can do, because understanding that that refining things and building things and like growing things in your gardens and like getting all those servants are will help you quite a lot in reducing the amount of manual grind you have to do. And again, it plays yep. into this: you start out with as more as like a lumberjack vampire, right? That's 
that's also been an interesting challenge. Like <laughs> yeah. the power fantasy meets this, yeah. like, the farmer, right? But you start up there uh, and in the end, we want you to feel more like this Lord that you are just doing your hunts and your servants are doing the things for you. Uh, and, and it's I, can, I think it's more been more challenging to, to teach the players about the importance of these systems rather than balancing the lobes themselves. Yeah, um, you, you did a really good job too with the uh, the the little like story quests too that kind of like lightly teach you, but it never feels tutorialish. I, I really like that where it was just like simple goals where it's like adventure tech tree to the point that you have um, like you build your castle heart or sit in a throne or actually uh, make a thrall. So I, I thought that that was uh, that was really cool and that moment as well when. The first time you actually do go out, you use that that power, the actual like vampire mesmerizing power and uh, like dominate your first villager and bring them back to the castle, throw them in a coffin and get them starting to do stuff. And you're like, you're my mod now. That is such a great <laughs> moment in the game. I, I that that blew me away because you don't see that system coming. <laughs> like it kind of comes out of nowhere. Uh, how hard was it to actually make that? Because that seemed like it's so different than every other system. Was was that like a difficult thing to get off the ground technically? Um, I, I guess we've been working on it for for like on and off all the time. Since that's something that we kind of want to, it, it needs to fit the puzzle with all other features, right? And it's also something that we want to keep expanding on in the in the future. But we feel like that was such a strong point like just in the vision of, of converting people because that's kind of core of the vampire team so we knew like we wanted in, in some form and, and it uh, i guess it, it some part was easy but just continue to adapt it like how how does it work with like defending your base how does it work with like you equipping it with items because we felt like that's also a good way to have them feel like you progress by actually investing in them uh, and also like adding the throne missions, which is a bit inspired of, of like World of Warcraft garrison and, and things like that. And we, we think servants are, are super important for the vampire's fantasy and it's something we definitely like want to continue to help out. We've been having discussions like, can they help you organize your stashes, for example? That's like Please. ongoing question and, and stuff like that. Yeah, that's so, uh... I, that, I that would be very favorite. useful for me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever played a single game where I didn't just have a million of the small boxes sitting around and they're just like, I, I stack that one up, I fill it up, I move on to the next one. I've already forgotten what's in the first one and yep. I don't even know what stuff I have. So yeah, that's a great idea. I, I also liked too, because the, the servants don't check for item durability right so you, mm -hmm. instead of repairing gear you just give it to your servants and <laughs> you're just yeah. like i i like kept doing that which, which was really enjoyable and then you know you come back to the to the server after you have to go do like boring real life stuff you get back you're like it's morbid time you jump mm -hmm. on and then everybody else has gotten further and you go up to the servants and they have better gear than you and you just steal it from them <laughs> they can't do anything which uh, I think, cool. yeah like one of the very important aspect we talked when we developed this game was actually to have these kind of when you play with your friends they usually you usually don't play exactly the same amount of time right and a lot of other survival games or mmo and things like that uses like an experience and level system have that kind of issue where you kind of feel behind like oh damn they are 10 levels above me i suck this is boring i'm gonna quit the game or i have yeah. to get power level and that was something we kind of really wanted to say like no if you don't have the same amount of time as your friends they can just give you the equipment and you're on par potentially you don't have the same amount of v-bloods but you still have like a full kit of spells so in a sense you you're the same power but they potentially have more var like variation and customization but we felt that was super important that you shouldn't I kind of constantly feel behind if you're not playing at the same uh, like amount of time. So, and so you have somebody else playing for you. Yeah, I get yeah. that. It's the detention with like the research system as well that you share like the things you find yeah. in books with everyone in in your clan. So that's that's like also plays into that that we wanted you to be able to just share everything with. And if you come on and the, your your friends have been playing, you can open the research desk and see oh they they got this new tech and you just learn it and you're 
you're on par with them. So that that's one of the reasons why we don't have like invested heavily in, in leveling systems and XP and that sort of things, but rather rely on on items and it, and the castle being the the primary the sort of progression. Uh, yeah, that is a, a really good feeling when you get on the server and then you go up to the table, like you said, and it's uh, if they've learned it and you haven't actually researched it yet, it has like that yellow spinning uh, around the rectangle. And yep. it, that moment is so much dopamine when you go and you see all of it. And usually for pixels like that, I would have to pay $25 for each pixel. So I, I was very happy that I didn't have to do that. And uh, everybody else just played <laughs> played it for me to get the research table up to the right, uh, right amount. And I do think it is cool, like you said, that it is the gear that is actually setting your level. It's not necessarily how much you played. So you can come back in, you can hear what everybody else did. They can catch you up on the stories. And then you go out and you do your hunt. So you still have the content to do. You can immediately hunt. play with your friends, right? You don't have to spend yeah. a lot of time grinding or anything like that. I, I do actually want to ask, like, conversely, you know, you have like many different servers. And I, I don't know if this would even really be possible with V Rising. Are, are there any plans to have like any level of real account wide progress whenever you go from server to server? Or would that just not really be compatible with like the different types of server uh, accelerations that you have? I would, it's like it's not been designed that way as it's it's very hard yeah. to make that compatible with the current system since mm -hmm. since the progression is within your castle and in your items you would really have to like move in your castle to a different server to have your progression mm -hmm. and and for that work you would need that space right not something where you could like land your castle on so so there, there i think there's definitely ways it could be designed technically and and level wise to allow for that uh but it's definitely a design challenge that that um would prove would, would be interesting to like deal with so it, it's currently i would say we, we don't have that plans but uh it's it's still an intriguing uh, idea well, i would say it's like possible since obviously we have servers where you can start with progression unlock and you can start with like a preset of gear and and Potentially, we could allow players to actually say, like, I own this item. And if the server allow for custom character or something, they could allow you in with, like, your inventory and your your, your tech. So I guess it's possible, but it's... Uh, it's also, yeah. like, since players can host their own private servers and we can't really control what goes on on these servers, uh, I essentially always have like need to have centralized servers to be in control of, of players accounts yeah. and, and stop cheating and stuff like that so yeah I, I remember i had a friend of mine that had his uh little sister do dungeons and dragons with him and give him like 15 levels because she was technically the dungeon master so i i completely understand why th that would not necessarily work out but i know it's a question that like i thought of whenever i first started playing the game and i know a lot of other people asked me too too as well so i figured i figured i would ask yep yeah, I, I think that like another thing with the game that I've really noticed a lot is that like if you look at the PvP and also the different types of servers that people have, you have some servers that are just like completely full loop PvP and other ones where it's just like a very minimal loss if you lose anything bad or anything like that. And I was wondering, are you ever thinking about having like larger really like chase item weapons because i'm not really sure if there are a whole lot where it takes like maybe three or four days to like get the materials to craft this or would that just be a little bit too extreme um like some something something that we're looking for now is uh what will the an end game look like right yeah what's the end game of uh v-rising and them thematically or, or or in our ambition will be to bring back dracula like that's the that's one of the things. Oh my god! So what okay. is what is Dracula? What is his entity? What is his role within in our universe? Uh, I think you can see like remnants of his castle today in like the the Dunley farmlands, uh, <laughs> and that's always been like a, a vision where we early on like what is his role? Will you be able to challenge him? Will you be be able to become Dracula in the end game? Will you be sitting on the throne of darkness? Like we have this. Game of Thrones vibes going on, like uh, yeah. and ideas for the different clans fighting for them, but also the different factions, like the undead faction, the 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 militia, maybe the church, like the the this um, politics and things that goes on. That that was something we had, were like we're really intrigued about early on in the development, and and still are. 
So I guess that's something that you will definitely see us working on will be our version, our vision of like Dracula returning to our world and as, as some sort of big event. And there will definitely be an end game scenarios there that will would add a lot of new co cool content. Very cool. Uh, I'm, cu I'm curious. Uh, oh, go ahead, Martin. No, I, I, I said that we talked about earlier, like uh, changing like these kind of events in the world. And that's also something as we also spoke to earlier, like Dracula isn't just the end game, like his effects on the world will will be notable even like early game. So you will definitely like that's the vision that his impact on the world will be something you kind of experience throughout the the journey. I, I am uh, I'm very curious because you, you obviously you work on the game for a very long time and you put it out into the world and then a bunch of streamers play it. You get to watch them play it. You get to watch all the content creators play it and a bunch of other people are playing it as well. And uh, obviously you get to watch the streamers play. Did anybody do anything where you're just like, what the heck? How did they do that? Like, did did like Shroud do something like absolutely crazy where you're like, we had no idea players were going to be able to do something like this in PvP? Um, or did everything that happened, was it kind of as you did expect? Because I, I, I feel like that's a pretty crazy leap of faith when it's like, okay, in the player's hands now. Let's see yeah. what you do. So, like, I, I have a couple of memories. I know, like, like, watching Lyric play the game for the first time, it was, like, hilarious. Like, the way he played the game and the way he used, the, like, the voice chat, because we haven't really, like, when we played internally, we're always in Discord, we haven't really been using that feature. And seeing that live, like, he's, like, screaming at people and they like, interacting <laughs> and having this, like, social experience within the game and seeing how, like, Mm -hmm. how they use this like social aspect of the game that was that was one moment that i had so much fun seeing him doing this stuff and but also seeing seeing like how things that we have designed actually worked out very well like he had this in, uh, i think it was like combat within this animal camp and there was like arrows going up all over the camp and, and bears were like came coming out from their cages and it was just he was in full control and then like everything just went went bad for him and it's like this chaos and, and seeing that in action like that was more like one of the design parts but play testing it internally when you know everything uh you don't know that how it will work out and seeing that was like a perfect 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 storm and everything just working the way we have intended so so uh, definitely we've seen both both ways uh, things that are totally we had no idea and things that actually work the way we wanted to and it's uh, equally um what is uh, equally uh, fulfilling to see it um did you have any martin that you can think about uh as you said we kind of uh, were very open-minded and wanted to be in more of a sandbox world so i i guess obviously there will be kind of exploits and ways to to kind of harass player which is always something we kind of try to look out for but there's always way to kind of uh, harass people and, and those are also things we want to keep looking at because doing like these multiplayer PvP games there's always this kind of way how to you how can we create a better play experience for everybody and and uh, just in many other games it's also ways that you can kind of destroy other people and that's that's something that I guess we wasn't surprised about it but uh, something we need to keep working on so I, I, I can't think of a single survival game that doesn't have that. Uh, just one way or another where you wait for the guys to go to sleep and then you break into their base while they're asleep or something crazy like that. But I, I don't even know what the possibility would be to stop that from happening. I think it's just the way some servers really are. Yeah, yeah I think there's there's always going to be the griefers. It's just how, how much can we mit mitigate it with yeah. different solutions. Um yeah, I think so. I mean, like, honestly, I see a lot of games that have like different systems that mitigate it, but really just making it as an open game and letting people experience it. As I said, like, I, I think one of the first things and I'm pretty sure you guys did intend this, but it was like one of the first things I did is I found a stone golem and I had him smash and cut down trees for me. Right. I mean, this yep, is yep. I, I'm not a genius here. You planned that. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> yes. I think no, I think I don't think we, we we planned it. It was more like we wanted them to break stuff, and then you saw yeah. like, oh, wait, I can use this to like get all this material, and we didn't want to balance out the fun of it. So it's like this is this is fine, this is nice. If people find this and use this as their like machine to to like get all these resources early on, 
then they will just feel happy about it. So we just like this, we will leave it, leave it in there. Yeah, so. I think same goes for like the V-blood as you describe, which people like when you can like cross this kind of patrols on the way and you have two V-bloods fighting each other and both are low health and you're kind of sitting there and then you kind of finish enough and you feel kind of smart about it. And those are kind of things like, do we want to prevent this or or is this actually kind of fun experience? And I mean, we feel like all those kind of moments is really, really fun that it's actually kind of random and, and can create these kind of ways to kind of feel smart as a player. And, and those are very important. If you try to balance everything out, it's kind of get a bit stale, right? So. Yeah, the game made me feel very smart a lot of times, which is saying something. <laughs> if, the game, if the game can make me feel smart, it can make anyone feel smart. Well, I think that... Uh, Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rich. Oh, no, I was just going to say those moments where I it, you have like it, that that vampire hunter. He just he that guy in particular patrols a lot of the lower level areas. And he yeah, I, I tried to kill him. You. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I and did. at first, before you really know much about the game, you're like. Am I even supposed to ever be able to kill this guy? And he, he's just sitting there. And then one time he was in combat with somebody else and I sat back. I let them chip off the damage and killed him kind of early. And like you said, the game actually, that little emergent moment that comes out of the way that they're patrolling, it does make you feel really intelligent as a player. And those are some of the memories that well, I, it's I remember. It's the open the world, right? It's like the, because the, a lot of games, they try to create the idea of, oh, it's a living, breathing world. And, you know, like, oh, the it, elements are interacting with each other. But one thing I've noticed a lot with the Rising is that, like, you'll see that even sometimes, I'll be honest, I've killed, tried to, I've tried to aggro like other mobs into bosses because I just couldn't fucking kill them. And so, like, I just pulled the other mobs into the boss and, you know, just makes it a little bit easier for me. And I've really felt like going around around through v rising you see a lot of just npcs interacting fighting each other just completely naturally through no uh consequence of what you're doing and i found that really does make the the world seem like it's more alive and you're more part of something bigger than yourself and it's not just a game yeah it's it's we're happy that you see it like because that was our intention right so it's, it's really cool that it's yeah. actually working out because as you're saying a lot of game developers you like you they want to have this vision of this world that is alive but it's really hard to pull that off and i think we still have like things that are stretched to go of course you always have uh but we do have like a good start we have some like base functional then we'll try to just figure out ways of, of uh, interacting with it more have you thought about doing like uh, instances at all? Like, uh, for example, uh, like in WoW, I mean, obviously you guys played WoW before, uh, like going into a certain area and fighting off something, or do you feel like the entire game should be mainly like an open world? I think we obviously talked about it, but it's really hard to say, like, do we want to kind of instantiate your party and say, like, you're safe. If you're inside here, you're safe. No one can come in and steal your kill or, or whatever. And those kind of slightly go against the core aspect of the game to be this kind of open world. Uh, so, so it's a bit hard to say, like, going that road, I think. But that, that wouldn't prevent us from, like, instantiating kings, but potentially have them open for more players to enter actually the same area as you. So I think we just have to be very careful to, to stay true to our core and obviously get all these feedback from the MMO players who want more permanent progression and, and, and character development and and raid bosses and stuff. And then you have another area of, of players who want a different route. And I think it's super great to get all this kind of feedback in, but we really need to be like true to ourselves and true to our core. Cause once you kind of start to listen to everybody, you, you're on a bit you, dangerous you road, right? So, yeah, I mean, but we as as a very strong point in Stanley is that we actually really want to play our game like we do a game that we enjoy playing ourselves and we play it like as if you stop playing your own game and you try to listen to feedback you're you're like on a slippery slope i think so and uh, yeah i i definitely think it's it's one of those things too where you kind of have to sit there and uh parse the information as well and hear what people are asking for but how you can deliver it while still keeping the core elements of the game there. Uh, I, I also do want to say a lot of people in chat, speaking of uh, people asking for stuff, a lot of people are asking questions in the chat already. We will do uh, questions 
from people in chat a little bit later on, and you'll just use the hashtag ask. So that way uh, we can organize everything. Uh, so you can hold those questions for now, and we will get to them in a little bit. Hashtag ask, A-S-K. Thank you. Uh, but yeah, Asmin. So I was going to say, like, this is probably a dumb question. You guys have got this probably 200 times. Is there ever going to be a way to have, like, a free look camera where you can look all the way around? There's, there's actually, like, some mods that allows you to have that. Uh, and we do have that for debug settings, and we use it for, like, traders and stuff. Oh, wow. So, uh, but it's, it's, it's like, aesthetically, the, the world has been designed with, like, a top-down view. So, so a lot mm -hmm. of things look really flat if you don't, like bring down the camera so it's more like of it's technically it's possible to play it that the that way but it's more more of a aesthetic thing like how will the game be perceived and some areas look really 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 nice uh but some areas look like very like a, a, a lot less good so to speak so uh it's more of an art direction thing but also like the gameplay of course like it's intended to be this top-down combat so uh and but we have a bit like of an on, on a conventional camera scheme right but with the mm -hmm. top down where you can rotate your camera um so so i get that there's a lot of players asking for like ways of adapting the camera and things for their playstyles to to navigate this 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 better so so i wouldn't i wouldn't say that that's that's not a dumb question at all it's just a very interesting question to to and uh something that we we will have to see what what we can do about um yeah you see okay. it here, like on the on the on the video yeah 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 i'm just i'm looking at it and yeah it does look like you can do it and you know be kind of like uh i guess like first person mode here absolutely i was just kind of nervous about asking a question because i feel like that's probably whenever i played the game and i've talked to other people that's been one of the main things that they've asked too so i'm sure you probably got that a lot dude how did pecky's already have that up in the back he was ready man he's he was. so he's so <laughs> fast man he's yeah. so good shout out to pecky's in the back making sure it works Oh, that was James, dude. Thank you, dude. We have we have a full team on Allcraft. It's actually. I, not. I remember uh, when we actually started everything off uh, at the very beginning, and we were using Skype. We were using Skype, and we would get calls in the middle of the show, and uh, you know, it would just interrupt the complete show. It was great. And so, yeah. from somebody named Greek God X. Yeah, Greek God X would call us. You got to Skype. Never, never actually him. Uh, but yeah, I, I do. We talked about it a little bit already, but I want to put a little bit more of a focus on it. Just like, what can people expect next? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, some of the stuff you probably can talk about, some of it you can't talk about. But yeah, what, uh, what can people expect next? Uh, yeah, yeah we, uh, as we talked about, Dracula is one thing that's always been like uh, in our core vision, and like he will return in, in a that's in a very impactful way, I think, uh, and we want players to be able to to challenge him in, in one way or another, right? We also talked about uh, looking into second floors and basement, those kind of things. We kind of live out the fantasy and, and creating this kind of castle. Uh, for, the, for the castle, as to add, add on that, like, the castle is so central to it, so, so that the floor thing is one thing. But we're also like seeing how we can get the the castle to be more central on, uh, especially on PV as well. As right now, it's primarily a target when you're playing PVP where you can raid other players. But currently, there's like no PVE threat. There's nothing that can like invade your castle, uh, yeah. and that's also like playing into those survival aspects of actually like having having factions that can attack your castle that you have to fend it off. And with that, like adding content such as like expanding on the servants for the combat, maybe traps and stuff that you want to in encompass in your castle when they breached your walls. Um, we always like had this ambitions with the castle to to stay true to this elegant, beautiful like gothic castle. So so traps and stuff like that is something we have been a bit cautious about as we don't want it to turn into like a bunker basically. So finding a good balance there where where we can like really push the, the PvP elements to make raiding more interesting, but also like giving this thrill of invasion uh, for, for PvE players. Uh, so, so I think yeah. the, the, like, the castle will be a central piece that we will be looking to uh, uh, and on different axes in how we can improve that uh, experience and, and, and add more content to it. So I saw a question in chat, and I know I'm going against what I said by 
trying to keep stuff organized, but I actually thought it was a really good question. It was one that I uh, I had initially wanted to ask as well. And th that is with those, the the bone uh, brazier, the bra browsers, braziers. I, I still don't know how to say it. I, I don't know. I don't know yeah, either. I, I, you typed it in the game, so you're, you already know how to spell it, which is good. Uh, they, so with those, they don't automatically shut off, right? You have to actually like basically turn it off. Now it's consuming bones. It gives you the mist. You're not you're not going to actually uh, die to the sun. It doesn't automatically turn off though uh, during the night. Would, would you? Is that by design? Did you guys want it to be a thing that people had to actually go and manually turn it off, or do you think one day maybe the, they will automatically switch on and off? I think we're like we're, we're a bit cautious here for all these things as we were talking about stashes as well, like sorting stashes and so on. Because there is also like uh, value in being the 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 player that like keeps the the house clean uh, and doing those things. Uh, so so it's like it's it's a mixed bag where we don't want to optimize everything, but we want to find like uh, 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 the right like value of quality of life, so that so that everyone can enjoy it so it's not too detriment detrimental to the gameplay loop for the ones that really hate sorting stuff or turning on turning off switches and so on so so i think like the servant one for example that martin was talking about allowing them to be like your your id duty going around fixing stuff maybe turning off the the, the brazier uh uh would be a cool way to like add that convenience uh later in the game as well so you don't get it all for all for free what what's your uh what's like so for example there's like two things i want to ask but like actually you know what i want to ask this right now so there's a lot of vampire fantasy things like we're talking about castlevania you're talking about like you know you can't move a castle around you actually could in castlevania what is some of the actual vampire fantasy stuff that you want to add into the game because i think that is so badass i have a lot of vampire fantasies yeah, m moving the castle was actually a thing we had in yeah. the previous. Video. Wait, what? Uh, yeah. Oh my god! You want to elaborate on that, Martin? Or yeah, I mean, as you said, Asman, we we kind of felt like when when playing other reference game, and it's like just moving is is a very tedious task, right? And that's something we will keep looking at, and and we have other ideas about that. So that's also so, an, an, a topic for the future, but. In a previous version, everyone had their own island, and you basically there were island slots attached to the edge of the map mainly, and you can like go to a, a new slot and teleport your entire castle to that uh, island instead. But a lot of issue we felt that was that the castle was too detached from the world. You kind of didn't run into them, and they were all a bit too samey. So mm -hmm. eventually, we felt like being them in the world and like chasing the world felt a, a lot better right but that was actually part from castlevania the the series that was actually the the inspiration from testing that out to begin with other things we're like that i would like like love to look into or things we are talking about is like the vampire hunters how they can play a more sinful role like we would love to see like more famous vampire hunters Van like Helsing? yeah yeah Okay. For example, yeah, and another as well that could like bring bring come in and you can like destroy your favorite vampire hunter within a game. That would be a really cool thing to to build up on, I think. Um, um, and for for the theme is something we will like uh, when we're like expanding the world as well with with the aesthetics and the units. We're like looking at a lot of these more horrors, more demons, more. Uh, we're talking a lot about like this Frankenstein inspired uh, village or city as well. Uh, so, so we're like, like, what are what can we take from? What can we be inspired from and add to like add all this kind of really cool horror theme the units into the game as well? Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I mean, I, I've I, I I love the Castlevania series, and so whenever I heard that you guys were doing some stuff based off of that, I got very very excited and started thinking about like all the different things they had in the game, and I I think that is so cool to take the different ideas and bring in like the vampire hunters, etc. Do you ever think that I mean, you talk about vampires, are you ever going to have like maybe werewolves? Can you ever play as a werewolf? Train would love that. Oh my god! <laughs> Do you know, I, 
Uh, I, and that's, I mean, obviously this question has risen up like multiple times. And I bet. I, I think we, we haven't, it's, it's a huge question which will require like a lot of thoughts, like how <laughs> would you like build up your base as a werewolf and how would that be? And was, would it be more faction wars that all the werewolves against the vampires and things like that? So for us, it's been too big topic and not the focus for our Alexis. So... I think it, it depends on like what angle as well. Like if you're seeing, <laughs> if you're looking yeah. at from more like a sandbox angle where you have like more custom game modes or like fun modes where you can have like the vampires versus the, the werewolves, I could definitely see that as more of like a mod thing. But for the core game experience, uh, I think we will stick with the vampire. Um, that would make sense because yeah. you know the name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It would, right? Uh, yeah, it's not called Furries Rising. <laughs> 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 they, they got they got uh, they got enough uh, they got enough games already. But the the thing that I I my mind instantly when you start bringing up all that stuff, it is really crazy how packed like vampires are. Uh, I start thinking of Buffy. I start thinking of Sam and Dean Winchester. Right, Asmin, you love those shows. I was thinking more uh, Kate Beckinsale from Underworld, but okay. Sure, sure. Like there, there's so many different fantasies. Uh, is there like a moment when you have such a packed lore that it's it's like kind of difficult? Where you talk about a lot of people saying a lot of different things about your game and trying to actually get community feedback. Does it ever turn into this kind of crazy thing where everybody's just like, "We need it to feel like Buffy in season two and they're like really into their lore and they have this idea of what vampires should be, or has it been relatively chill to be working within that the, the vampire lore? So we have a lot of like work on the narrative that has like led us through the development, but since it's it's not very 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 little of the narrative is explained to the player, as uh, we're not a story driven game, right? The players are the story. The players tell the tell the tale of each server. Uh, so we've always had like seen that the narrative, the lore, is important to guide us, but we've always been like. Ready to, if we need to change it to make the game better, we are ready to do this as well. So we don't really, we, we don't want to be handcuffed by our own like narrative, but we will, st we still want to respect that work and the things that we have created, even though it doesn't like show uh, a lot of it in in the game. Um, I think that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And you talk about like the, the players are the story. And I was wondering, like you're talking about like, you know, potentially summoning Dracula. I don't really see this as something that would probably happen on the first day of a server. So what do you view? Like, what is your ideal life cycle of a server? Because, you know, on Tarkov or Rust, you have like wipes and everything gets kind of reset. Like how long would you assume or want to see a server evolve through different kind of phases? Yeah, it's it's like it's something we're trying to figure out right now yeah. because what we feel is that we definitely want to be able to have players like play play again and again and again and and there are the, the community is a part of it is already doing this by hosting their own like private servers running their own settings running for like a week to the top and stuff like that. Um, but we also do not want to like reset reset everyone's castle or thing that they they've invested into unless we have like a big update or something new content. So that they feel like okay we're resetting your stuff but you will be having all this new cool stuff to to dive into when you come back so it's a balance between like respecting players as at least on our official servers while on the private servers you can do like whatever you want right but uh, uh it's a balance between like when do we add new content and when do we reset the world because once we do add some features some content we need to reset the world technically we cannot like change the layout of the world without forcing a reset, right? Um, yeah. While there are things that we can fix, we're like hot fixing things right now. But uh, in the long long run, we are like looking at uh, at a scheme where we will be having like these big updates, and we'll have definitely have resets along with them, uh, and then see like how will this more PvP focused seasons what what will that look like uh, in the end game? That's something we're still trying to figure out now. Um, Oh, you mentioned seasons. So, so you're thinking like there's going to be different, like I'm assuming not necessarily like a Warcraft or League of Legends season or something like that, but where you kind of continuously like buff and change the different abilities, add in new abilities to keep the combat fresh and just kind of keep the game new in the player's eyes. 
yeah, as, as so we're saying, like once we do hit like a big patch, we will mm. most likely want to reset everything. And with that, you will have to play again and and uh, compete like from the get go. And exactly how that will turn out is something that we will have to figure out once we get closer to our, our first like big update. And we don't really have like any clear answer to when that will when that will hit. Um, but uh, yeah, how we define like a reset or a season semantically, uh, we will just have to see as we as we go along. But uh, long term, like yeah, hopefully we'll have like some sort of more controlled space where we figure out like how often do we want to do this, how often can we do this, like how how much content do we need to put out for this to be worth it like that's a lot of things that we need to figure out over time for sure uh makes a lot of sense and now guys i do want to let you know i'm going to start opening up those questions uh for you guys in chat so if, if you do the the hashtag ask and throw in the question we'll start picking up a, a few of them here in, in a few minutes i i, I want to do one more question before okay. i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna take the chat's question time i'm gonna say one right here and this is it so whenever you start playing the game, you pretty much kill the same bosses, you collect the same stuff, and you have uh, roughly like the same leveling up experience pretty much every time where it's the same types of bosses. Do you have an idea of maybe uh, like kind of rotating that or trying to make it a little bit more dynamic so you're killing bosses in maybe a little bit of a different order or you have a more, uh, you know, kind of open-ended progression path? Yes, it's just definitely like one of the bigger challenges is like that replayability. Mm -hmm. As as we have this handcrafted world, we have this very uh, nice linear progression where everything is logically yeah. tied together. You have like this archer in the bandit animal camp, and she like gives you the knowledge about tannery. It's all connected, right? So if you would just scramble that, uh, that 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 would like break some of the immersion and some of the the logic within the world. Uh, but at the same time, for replayability, for sandbox values, scrambling those sort of things, like changing the world layout and, and the bosses, maybe the levels, would make sense for, like, it would be a more fresh experience. So it's, it's a bit of, like, it's a very hard choice there. And uh, today, like, we're not sure if we would, like, can do both of it. But it's definitely something, like, we want the replayability to be the, the, the dynamics. But will it be, will it be a static uh quest line or progression line like right now and we work more with the aspects around that the emergent gameplay factors or do we like actually change up the bosses introduce maybe new ones change up what you unlock from each boss uh, and scramble it more uh i guess that is like the harder path to go from a design perspective looking at where the game is right now yeah, it's like it's almost like a pick one. You can either have a cohesive story or you can have randomized elements. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get that. OK, all right. Now now we can do questions. I just I figured I had to ask that because I know that uh, a lot of people have wondered that. And I had kind of like restarted my character a couple of times. and I was wondering if, uh, you know, it would be different or not. But yeah, I mean, I'll have to say, like, I feel like this game, especially for like an early access game, is really, really well polished. Like, I, I, I want to say, like, great job, guys. Like, this is in, insanely Thank good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I started to tell you guys my story before we even uh, we, we even started the show. But I, I played the game, and all of a sudden, I just got completely... Uh, now I'm going to sound like I was trying to make a pun, but I got completely sucked into it. And uh, I I, ended, I actually remember, as in, I messaged you, and I was like, dude, you got to play right now. Like, I, I got yeah. so drawn in by the game. And it pretty much changed the course of, of my week. And I enjoyed it a whole bunch. And I'm excited to see everything that you guys do. And I'm also excited to see all the questions that everybody has in chat right now. First one's coming in from Thorvald. Are you guys looking into more weapon abilities? Yes. yes. Short answer. So, <laughs> yeah, yes. right. oh, there, there, we go. there we go. You got your yeah. answer, Jen. <laughs> Okay, great. Yeah, that's good. I uh, are you guys gonna add in like a two-handed greatsword? There's there's already a two-handed greatsword uh, on what its the way. Hell? On its way. Oh, uh, I was about to say. Uh, <laughs> so so, but, okay. but yeah, well, like the long answer I would say is like we're definitely going to add abilities, weapons, and spells. But we also are looking into like how can we 
add another axis so that you can actually maybe modify the current spells, modify the weapons as well. So, so itemization is something that we haven't actually spent too much time on so far, and something that we want to look into further to see to push it not only more content, but maybe add a, a layer of depth to the, the current items uh, spells as well. Okay, yeah, that, that's very, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> that's good. All right, we can go to the next question. And uh, yeah, what are some of the, uh, the devs' favorite Easter eggs in the game? Oh, good question. Okay. <laughs> Easter eggs. Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think, I think there's like some of the like text in the crypt door or like some <laughs> scribbles from some of the artists, like the names of us. I, I know there's like a picture that's named like after me, I think. Like, I just, I, I came across it when we were live. It's like, what? It's like <laughs> Baron Ilvas. Like, what is this painting? Like, so, so it's always the like artist putting in stuff. Sometimes we get trouble with it. Because they've been putting in stuff that we're not really allowed to put in there, but uh, yeah. they, they are a bit more ca careful right now because we've actually uh, hit that wall a couple of times earlier. Um, but you still find some like fun things that people add when they have uh, yeah. some time off to to come up with fun stuff. Um, I'll, I'll say also like watching people go into the to the spoiler alert uh, the the werewolf village basically going in there during the day and then it turns into night and everyone is transformed into werewolf those kind of first reactions seeing that on stream has been very very fun and, and entertaining so yeah they're just yeah. waiting that way and they have no idea what's going to happen <laughs> we'll, we'll move on to the next question um we already saw that one okay there we go uh will there be official mod support um not something that we're currently looking into. Like we, we, we did like ship with a lot of settings and modifiers so that you can adjust your servers. And that's something we'll definitely look into adding even more settings as we go about so that you can customize your experience. But in terms of like total mod control and, and like changing up things like spells or even like altering the world, that that's like th those kind of bigger things is currently something that we will be, uh, be on hold. Sure. that's good it's good that people have the mods too and like also like one of the big differences between like your game and a lot of other games too is like you have a lot of customization for like each different server so if you want to run it a certain way that's kind of already built into the game yeah so it's, it's mm -hmm. like controlling that as well so so that uh once you go into server, like the player also needs to know like what are the settings, what are the admin, what can you do with it as as yeah. uh, someone else is in control right and yeah, I understand that. Absolutely. Uh, I, there's one question here from Chad. I figured I'd just take this one right here. Are there any questions to allow servants to accompany you on your journeys? Uh, I guess that's been also under discussion uh, when we talked about expanding the servant system. Uh, but it's a, it's a lot more tricky when, we, when you try to kind of drag them into the world because how they kind of react could be in many cases kind of un unwanted behavior so it's definitely in the looks i would say or or like it's in there to to look into when we expand the search system but we also don't want to end up in a system where you kind of get kind of annoyed uh, on their behavior and how you kind of move and and act in our game is is kind of advanced in a way uh, making it a lot harder to, to do a proper implementation where the players are kind of satisfied with their uh, behavior in, in that sense. Okay, yeah, yeah you, I you think that would make sense. Go yeah, ahead. You don't want to like get a thrall and then it starts acting like Mizkif or something stupid like that. It would well, get you really upset. It's just running around, killing stuff. Like I have that happen in like a lot of games where you have a pet or like in PoE. I remember whenever one of the leagues came out, I couldn't get my pets to stop attacking something I didn't want them to, and they killed it and upset me. So yeah, I definitely understand how there could be a lot of pain points there very quickly. So it's definitely something that would be hard to balance and hard to uh, hard to code to make it not be annoying. Yeah, I feel like you would, you would, you would hate that, Asmin. If your pet wasn't doing something right, you would actually have to kill something yourself. So yeah, I'd have to do <laughs> that'd be, that'd be really bad. Mm -hmm. Like especially our, our core system isn't really designed to trade attacks, which you can see in other like 
target MMOs or things like that. So just having this kind of constant dodge attack is is a lot more advanced. Right? Okay, that makes sense. We can go to another question and uh, take a look at some of that. And uh, the uh, I, I feel like, oh, here we go. How long do you think early access will last? I feel like this is a question that a lot of people probably, you've probably answered this a million times. Yeah, I think we don't like have a clear, mm -hmm. clear answer right now, but we, yeah. we, we don't like see any value really to be in early access forever as well. Like for Battle Right, we were in early access, I think for one about one year. Um, but it's uh, when we go out from early access, it's more that we want to have like this complete experience of we rising. A lot of the things that we were talking about here today is that that's the things mm -hmm. that we want to add for a full launch. We want to have them in there. Then some of these things may come like in 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 some updates along the road, or it will come later uh, with with things more bundled. But uh, I think a lot of the things we've touched is things that we will want to have ready before we like say now it's time to launch the game in in official way okay yeah it makes sense and uh whenever that happens is it going to come to consoles it's uh, consoles always intriguing uh mm -hmm. something that we did learn with battle right was that one once we launched and we had a success with it one of the mistakes that we did was to take on too much things too quickly like we grow the studio very quickly we like work with uh uh, we game in China. We like did things in South Korea with Nexon, uh, and we we just took on too much that we could handle at at that time. So this time we will like we are looking to be uh, more cautious so that we can put our time on the PC version first to 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 not like get stuck in our access uh, forever. Um, but it's it's like consoles are are it's it's interesting but i would say that right now we will not uh, we will not like jeopardize too much of our team on uh, on uh, on doing that tar that type of porting maybe that could be like a partnership we, we will see but we will like we're totally focused right now at least on 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 the pc experience first Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Do you, do you find it's like a struggle whenever you're talking about like, you mentioned this multiple times is like trying to maintain like their own like creative integrity and vision for the game. And like now that the games come out, how much has that really shifted your vision for what you originally planned the game to evolve into? Uh, I think as, as we were mentioning here, some of the things about Dracula, Dracula and everything has been here from mm -hmm. the beginning and things that we still like, this doesn't really shift. The thing we do get like all this feedback and as, as martin was saying it's still like we need to channel that feedback and we need to stay with the core of the game with the vision and not get lost uh at the same time there's so much good feedback and ideas that like bring are invaluable to us when we like push forward and seeing what people like what they don't like don't dislike things that we just need to fix so it's always a balancing act but since we've like have a lot of years experience now i think we're a lot more capable of handling that of not getting lost or listening to, to too much to the players but like val valuing it and balancing it internally and being more professional about it so um if that answers your question uh, yeah i think so pretty much yeah. i was just curious go ahead rich no no i was just gonna say that makes a uh, makes a lot of sense and we'll, we'll keep moving with uh, the questions that everybody's asking but yeah no i think anytime somebody likes a game like one of their first reactions is like why can i play it on my phone but it's just like such yeah. a huge undertaking and you know uh, i i think it's really exciting to actually see what you're going to do for that core pc experience uh what customization options can we expect to see moving forward that comes from track cool tv yeah i know like there's uh this is a fun thing right because it, the customization has been an important part for us in the fantasy of like you creating your own vampire, right? But when you play the game, you're like you're very zoomed out, you don't really see a lot of these details, but we still find a lot of value in this feature allowing players to like feel that they're creating something that is theirs. So we will we will still be adding like more options in, in like all these things that we have, like hair types, new uh, accessories, stuff like that. Um, from from a body type perspective, I don't think we will be we will probably not do too much in allowing you to change your body types as it affects like the itemizations, the equipment, the things that, mm -hmm. that takes us. It just makes everything go so much slower when we add content because you have to create 
like multiple versions of each chest piece and stuff like that. So I don't think that's something we will expect, but we will add content to the exist existing layers and there might be might be new additions as well that, that will come up during the development. Yeah, I think it's also worth mentioning, like in terms of customization, when we go to, we see, we were kind of seeing a lot of more RP servers started to be creating and people like want to exactly like live in the SDF empire. And we will also look at other ways to kind of improve the, the, the role playing experience by, by, yeah, we talked about potentially adding transmog. We've talked about how can we add more ways to the castle? Like, can we have ways to play music, ways to kind of create this kind of ballroom potentially, or like making a big dining table where everyone can dine and, and drink blood. And, and there's like ideas and we think it's important to also think about that aspect of the game and see what can we make to, to, to create that way to allow people to just live more as a vampire, but also help out with the vampire fantasy. Yeah, I, I am curious as well. The... We'll, we'll keep moving with the chat questions, but this is a question that I, I kind of wanted to ask that I forgot to ask now that you bring it up. And you have such a fully fleshed out PvE and PvP system, right? And I feel like the first thing that I saw as well was people just electronically role-playing. Is that something that you expected with the game because of the, there being vampires? Like, did you expect so many people to be RPing? Or was that a bit of a surprise when you actually saw everybody, like so many people enjoying the game in that way? Yeah, as, as Peter said, we never done any games with like in-game voice and stuff like that. And just seeing how powerful that is, uh, it was a bit surprising. And also we come from a kind of niche hardcore environment. So getting all these kind of new types of players were obviously something that was kind of new for us in a way. Uh, but we wanted to keep the doors open. But definitely. Yeah, think, uh, that was quite fun as well with the game as it like attracts these hardcore PvPers, but also these explorers, these role players, these castle builders. There's so many types of players and, and we were like, we don't want to negate any one of them. We want to look at like, what do they like about it? Like, what do this role playing community, like it's, it's as, what do they want? Like, do they want a way where they can like interact more with their, their castle? Do they want to interact with their servants? Do they want to have their, these like rooms where they can invite people to serve like blood in different bowls and stuff like that? Just just yes, yes, role play the vampire fantasy, right? So so we, we really want to like encompass all these different to be target target players as well, so that there's something something new for everyone. So uh, I think there's a lot of focus right now on the systems, right? But we also want to see what how what plays like, but how they use the, the the sandbox environment of the game as well. It's funny just seeing chat right now, just everything that they're bringing up that they would like to see in the roleplay world. I do not think that you guys are adding cat girls anytime soon, though. So chat, you can you can cool it with that. Uh, but we will take a few more questions here from chat. Uh, just please don't make them about cat girls. Uh, most of the, so so this question is coming from somebody that does not seem to be from the role playing community. It seems much more focused on the hardcore elements of the game. Most people use scythe. Will you modify weapons so that they will be as effective as the scythe? So, this yeah, so we'll it. yeah, it's more like a balance question, right? And 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 we will be we're all looking at the the general balance of all weapons and spells. I, I think we did a hot fix like the other week that addressed some of the uh, ability overpowerness. So we're definitely tuning things uh, along the way. Um, so. Uh, um, Effectively, I think also what with, with the with the side it's interesting because it's it might be perceived a bit more powerful in, in the numbers than it's actually is when you like calculate it. So I think it's something with that AOE and everything that feels really good to use as well. So it's it's not always like that the numbers are totally off. It, it's sometimes it's just also like the feel of it. So but we're keeping a keeping a close eye on it if we're like balancing, making it more juicy with effects or tweaking the numbers to get the right feel in every weapon. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Trackmore uh, played axes before he asked that question. <laughs> the, axe, <laughs> the axe feels so good. I love the axe. I love the bow a lot, too. I, I, I really do use the crossbow. Bow. Like, yeah. whenever you're low level, the crossbow, it seems like it does more damage to higher level targets. So I think I spent about 20 minutes killing a Treant at, like, level, like, 10 or something like that. It was great. And so, yeah, I totally, <laughs> I, I totally like that a lot. That's usually what I kill most bosses with, even. 
Yeah, I just love the crossbow too, how much it really does allow you to utilize whatever kit you set up with your spells. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously you can change that for the other uh, melee focus weapons as well, but just being somebody who likes to use spells typically in games, the crossbow definitely felt like it uh, suited my playstyle. But great question, Drakmore. I, I definitely do think uh, talking about some of the balance of what we can see in the future is uh, something that's pretty cool. But we got uh, enough time for a few more questions here i see a bunch of them flowing in so we'll take another one will we see any end game replayability when it comes to v blood bosses currently most once most bosses are killed you can kind of forget about them right and get that power and then you don't need to actually attack that boss again yeah i think um um for for, for the v bloods are actually designed in a way where we uh don't want them to be like a grind where you like return to them and kill them over and over and over again. Like we, we have intentionally made them so that people don't stack up around and, and like just grind to get some items or stuff like that. But we'll definitely look into like more challenges or units for the end game that could be more interesting in more a, a grind or, or event based way where with, with, with gathering players for moments uh, and fight over the bosses, fight over the like some elite units and stuff like that. But the wee blood bosses in the, the progression loop is is intentionally designed to not be killed over and over again. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, especially so you don't want to have people like trying to farm the same stuff over and over and over. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we can do uh, maybe like one more question, maybe two. See what happens. I know I'll uh, while we're going to the next one, I want to ask. Uh, do you guys think you're going to have any other different types of mounts in the game? What, what, can you say the question again? Oh, sorry. Oh, like different yeah, types of mounts, start, like uh, riding a player like or, you yeah. know, so, yeah, I, I think, it, it, yeah, sorry, I messed up. Yeah, are you going to have like different other types of mounts, like maybe a, a, a bear or, uh, I don't know, like a tiger or something like that? I mean, this is, oh, this is a, a wow question, basically, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we already have seen some like ideas from our art team, which already like mm -hmm. uh, concepting on on always like new ideas on on both units and mounts. So uh, we will definitely have the doors open for for things like that. So I think it's also we did have early, in an er, earlier version you could like ride a wolf and like a bear, but then it also like conflicted with the ability to shape shift into these creatures as well. Yeah. So, so we did like we wanted to find a good balance where what can you mount and what can you shape shift into because it's like strange to be a bear mounting a bear, for example. So, uh, we, for, for clarity, like we said, like let's let's go for horses to begin with. It's very like it's basically like a car from from this time, and it, it's very natural. Uh, and let's not go at least not let's let's not go with the things that you can shape shift into so so maybe there will be more things to shape shift into rather than there will be a lot of more types of mounts uh i would say man if you could shape shift into a horse i know forza would definitely play the game so that would be something that would be pretty cool to see um but yeah no the first moment when you you transform into an animal is such a a cool milestone as well i, I actually don't i probably shouldn't say uh all of the animals that you can turn into uh, because I don't want to spoil the entire game for people. Guys, <laughs> you, you can check the game out on Steam as well. I, I did see that the mods were posting the link to Steam uh, in the chat. But yeah, I don't want to spoil all of those moments because there are some that definitely uh, caught me off guard. First time I was able to thing. transform into a wolf, I thought that was pretty cool. I, I played it the first time on my, on my second stream and it just happened. I didn't even know what happened because I'm the kind of person that, like it can literally be in like big text in front of me and somehow I don't see it. And they finally told me how to do it, and I thought that was just so cool. So yeah, being able to transform into different stuff is, uh, uh, again, it's like more of the fantasy of playing the game, feeling like you're actually part of it and like you're out in the world, you know, more so. And uh, I, I do think we should take this last question here, which is the uh, question about leaderboards. Do you think that you'll ever have any sort of like global PvP rankings or arena in the game? I think that's... I got it. Uh, okay. Yeah, we talked about different ways to kind of potentially expose data for, uh, through like an API or, or other things like that that basically allow players to to their, do their own uh, PvP ranking or things like that, depending on what they feel like is worth. To, okay, like do they want to count kills? Do they want to count collecting resources or, or boss kills and stuff like that? So, in a way, we we kind of want to have allow more 
customization as we said like we we prefer to choose solution which allow the players to kind of point the way uh, rather than like do a, a kind of fixed way that we say this is the way it's intended to to calculate like if you say so it also like i would also add like it, it depends on how well it ties into the core loop and it's been on uh, like something we have been touch upon like when for, for the return of dracula for example will there be some co- sort of like point the reputation system of being dracula can you can you claim that power from another player and then how long can you stay dracula before someone else steals it from you we already kind of have uh have that in in us in a small way today by in the end game you can claim these soul shards and there can only be one on of each type and you can bring them to your castle and defend it but on top of that if we could have like a, a score or a system that would actually like have a more of a end game goal so that you can actually win the server that uh, and and if that could t- tie into this end game i think th- that could be like a cool thing for this more hardcore players who just want to go go at it and play it more like a uh, uh, a full full playthrough and let's see who wins wins it and then we go at it again right yeah i think that makes a lot of sense for sure and like adding in an arena or like a ladder system also adds in its own kind of problems because you know we were talking about earlier the scythe and as soon as people decide that one weapon is better and then everybody's all using that weapon and it just becomes very formulaic so i can see that being a double-edged sword absolutely yeah not not to be punny but yeah definitely it is one of those things where the wonder of the game is one of the things that that keeps it being so fun the, the meta is is kind of one of those things that, that can put a lot of pressure on development for sure um i i was super excited to actually get to chat with you guys today peter and martin thank you for for coming on the show it's also very cool to get to hear somebody you know started off as a world of warcraft player now out in the world making games uh thank you guys for coming on today and uh sharing everything with us Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's yeah. really fun. fun being here t- talking to you guys. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. And again, uh, if you want to be able to follow V Rising and uh, play the game, uh, it's on Steam right now. I think actually, isn't it on sale? I'm pretty sure it is. And so you guys can uh, can just pick it up and uh, play it out. And uh, there's plenty of videos on YouTube if you want to look at some gameplay firsthand and uh, see for yourself. But yeah, I played it myself. Rich has too. And uh, it's a pretty good game. I enjoyed it a lot. I'm playing it again tonight, boys. So that is uh, th- that is definitely the plan. So you guys can check that out too during the mm-hmm. after show that we're going to be doing tonight where you can obviously ask me and Asmin any questions just like every week, whether they're about the rising or um, about anything else. I don't know what else you would ask us about, but uh, pretty much anything is on the table. Right, Asmin? Uh, pretty much anything. Not anything, though. Uh, a- unless it's more questions about why I didn't play Final Fantasy today. You know, that that's about it. Everything else is totally okay. But yeah, guys, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really appreciate it. I... As I said, I, I, I want to finish the game. Now that you're talking about the Great Sword, I am... I'm, I'm very, very interested. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. And we do have guys, we do have one announcement here that we want to make at at the end of the show. Um, There is a a little thing that uh, Rich has been working on, etc. And uh, we'd like to show it to you guys and uh, give you a peek of uh, what's about to be happening. (laughs) Please, you have to help me. I've been stuck on this island with no food, water, more importantly, viewers to inflate my sense of self ego. Oh, no. Do you know what the worst thing is? On, is it June or July? On June 13th, Baja Blast and Baja Zero Sugar are releasing for limited times only. And if I don't get off this island, I'll never get to sip the sweet ambrosial flavors of Baja Blast and Baja Blast Zero Sugar. And their two new limited flavors, Mango Gem and Baja Gold. No! Wait, what's that? I'm saved. It's a bottle Baja Blast, and there appears to be a message inside. I like, 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 ah! Wait, don't, you know the line? Don't take it out yet if you don't. It says, fans can grab spe- uh, fans can grab specially marked bottles of Baja Blast to enter for a chance to win $1,000 daily on treasuresofbajaisland.com slash do. Thank God you're here. Wow, that sounds like a great opportunity for some self-promo. What would Ms. Kiff do? I know, he would announce another game show. 
<laughs> That's right, we're announcing OTK's newest game show in partnership with Mountain Dew Baja Blast. And I'll be your host, me, Rich Campbell. I, I can't believe they approved that. Me neither. I, I've actually been taking acting lessons with my significant other, but I'm upset because the, the part that he used is me getting ready to cry. I, I did start crying, and I, I thought that he would edit out me warming up, and it would just end with me crying, but he used the outtake as the take. But yeah, I got a game show. Yeah, great. All right, there we go. When is the first episode? uh tuesday yeah it's literally Holy tuesday shit, it's too oh my god i didn't realize it was this soon wait wait Peck, okay. what'd you say tuesday of it's tuesday at 5 okay. ct as you can tell a lot of people behind the scenes help make this possible as we're literally having production in our ear telling us what time it's live uh so yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be every tuesday at uh at five and guys, uh, there's a bunch of secret stuff that I can't even announce yet with the game show, with the format. It's going to be a little bit different than some of the OTK shows that we've done in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a lot of cool ideas for co community involvement, some cool ideas that I, I was told not to tell you guys about. There are a lot of ways that you guys can actually get involved. And uh, the show itself, we actually, uh, to give you a little bit of behind the scenes, we actually developed the the game show itself for this one almost a year ago and we've just been waiting for the right time uh so I, i'm pretty excited to actually do it and uh asman definitely should uh come on the show sometime imagine me coming on the show wow that would be crazy wouldn't it yeah i think i'll probably do that guys of course i will gentlemen i want to say thank you all so much for watching today i really fucking appreciate it we had a great show we had a lot of fun uh and uh i think we're gonna be back on saturday and uh maybe we'll play a little bit of final fantasy 14 imagine that I really can't at this point. So, uh, yeah, we'll play a little bit more of that. And uh, absolutely. And maybe do some other stuff, too. So thank you guys so much for watching. We're going to be going on over to Rich's stream and uh, doing some of the after show, taking some of your questions, everything else like that. Thank you guys so much for watching today, guys. I really fucking appreciate it. And uh, I will see you guys over there on the after show. Until next time, boys. Peace.